Welcome psych students. Today we're going to look at uh, Unit 2, Biological Bases of Behavior. We're looking specifically at the biology behind things and the neuron. And some of this is based on Paul Bloom, uh, the psychology professor and researcher at Yale University. He gave a, a lecture um, on one of the free, kind of open to the public classes that Yale does. And it kind of adapted some of what he was discussing in his lecture there in one of the intro one of the very first classes that he, he teaches at Yale so some good information here we're gonna look at really what's behind this chapter what's the reason for the fascination in psychology of um, the brain and the neuron and the nervous system and and how all this functions to me, a lot of it has to do with just the fact that for us to understand um, a person's behavior and a person's mind, we have to know that um, are they healthy or are they, su are they suffering from something that could lead to uh, psychological or behavioral issues, then it's all due to, to their biology. The astonishing hypothesis is something that Frank Crick, a Nobel Prize winning biologist, uh, wrote about and talked about. And the quote goes like this, You, your joys, your sorrows, your sense of identity, your free will, are no more than a vast assembly of nerve cells and their molecules. This is something that's difficult for us to comprehend, and that's basically what the beginning of this is going to be about. We're going to look a little bit deeper at dualism and monism, mon monism this idea that, you know, like one or is it two? Are we one body, brain, all kind of connected? Or are human beings made up of a body <clears throat> and a brain or mind that is very separate from? their body. So most people don't agree with Francis Crick. Uh, it's an odd and unnatural view, at least at first, and, and you may not believe this after this course or after uh, this discussion today. You may think exactly how you have thought before, but the way I feel about it is that if you don't understand how scientists are looking at it, and this is a science class, Really, it's a social science class, but it is a class based upon the the proven nature of science. If, you, if you're not sure what what how they feel about this and how they feel about biology, then you're never really 100% understanding where they're going with this research. This is not about really about your beliefs, because beliefs are uh, the strength of uh, purpose that you have based upon you know how you've been brought up and what you believe uh, is most important to you and that's where we kind of hang our spiritual hat so let's talk a little bit about this because if we're wrestling with this today this is something that people have wrestled with since the beginning of time really or till the human brain could comprehend it Rene Descartes <clears throat> was someone and we've mentioned Descartes before he's somebody who um, has been brought up with this dualism idea in the past and, and he was somebody who believed in God and he believed in a spiritual world but he was also a scientist and so he was looking at the world and trying to measure these properties and, and see you know what what is it and really he was one of the first deep philosophers to start with a simple principle and we're going to get there in a second, but he really began to ask himself questions about, are humans merely physical machines? Are we like the physical machines? And you may say to yourself, well, what's a, he didn't have machines in his time period, but they did have some. We're going to see this in a second. But after thinking about this and trying to comprehend it, he came back with no. You know, animals are machine-like to him. They don't have the kind of uh, mind, this understanding and he said, but humans do. And so we have this special ability or special way of, of thought that other um, other entities on the planet don't have. So we're not just an animal. We're something more. And we're not just physical. We're also immaterial souls that have a physical body. Kind of both. 
and I think a lot of people would probably agree with that, but Francis Crick doesn't, or didn't. Um, the 17th century perpetual motion machines of the French gardens, those were things that Descartes had experienced and had seen. Uh, machines that worked on their own with simple uh, water to propel them, like the one at the bottom here, or levers or pulleys. And what he would witness with that is, wow, that's a machine like maybe we see a car being today or, or those types of things. And he knew right away, he said an automated machine or robot, which we sometimes have today, putting things together for us, um, they are not human. But certainly humans were much better than that, or not just a machine. I mean, he, he, he knew that, but how could he be sure? So he went about trying to prove this and, and think through this uh, with a kind of a thought exercise here. And his first argument is the creativity and spontaneity of the human action. And for instance, like the use of language. Um, <clears throat> we use language in a way that other um, entities, beasts, animals on the planet don't. Um, I'd say in a deeper way anyway. But another way of thinking about this dualistic perspective is if someone asks you, how are you? We give an answer that we don't really think about most of the time. We'll just spit out, I'm okay, or doing good. We don't really think that that represents how we were doing. We're just being kind and nice and going on about our day. But we could choose, and he was thinking through this, we could choose to not answer just the standard response like a computer would or a robot would. We could decide, hey, I'm pretty awesome. Thanks for asking. Uh, if I do say so myself, I'm pretty awesome. But you can change that and decide not to go with the standard response. So in some ways we're robotic, like with language, but we also then can take control of it and steer it in the direction that we want. Argument number two is really pretty fascinating, and some people kind of credit him with developing the first conceptual idea of the matrix through this, because Descartes, said to himself, what can I be sure of? What if everything I'm experiencing in this life is just a dream? It's not really reality. I, how, am I, how, do, how am I sure? Because when I'm asleep and I'm dreaming, I don't know that I'm dreaming. And, and I'm not sure he went into the dream factor, but you could kind of think through it that way as well. Is life, like what I'm experiencing and seeing right now, is this just, just some kind of trick? maybe a demon, and he was a pretty spiritual guy, as most people were in that time period, maybe a demon is tricking me, or this is all just an illusion. How do I know I'm not crazy? Because crazy people sometimes believe they're seeing things, and they're not seeing it. He, he focuses in on one thing he cannot doubt and cannot question, that he is himself thinking, and that leads to the phrase, I think, therefore I am. Therefore I exist, therefore I am here. And this is the launching pad, really, for philosophical thought for him. It's like point number one. I mean, you can't go anywhere else until you, you realize that. He couldn't be sure of his senses, what he's, his eyes, his ears, his uh, tongue and nose and his fingers and his touch were telling him. All the senses could be is a trick. The other argument here, and thinking through this, I think, therefore, I am argument, um, there's something really different about having a mind, is what he comes around to. And he says, the soul by which I am, what I am, is entirely distinct from my body. And it seems like common sense, because when we talk about things like my arm, my heart, we're, we're saying the same kind of thing, like my child or my car. Or, you know, and back to, well, my leg. Almost like we own that thing, and it's not just a part of one entity. This is difficult for, for some kids to get, wrap their heads around, but we talk about owning our body like it's separate from us. And so is us this mental capacity that he's thinking of, like a soul, or is the mind separate from the body and we've seen dualist perspectives quite a lot and we see it in 
in life all the time. And, and you may be familiar with the movie Freaky Friday that's been done a couple times. So the Jamie Lee Curtis, Lindsay Lohan version is at the top. And at the bottom, um, the original version with um, uh, Jodie Foster. But we sit there in the movie theater, we watch this, this movie, and we think to ourselves, oh yeah, there's a person who inhabits somebody else's body. And we almost believe that that could happen, like because the mind is separate. So you can imagine it because we kind of believe that for ourselves in everyday life, or many people do. So personal identity, like many people, one body, you can extend that to another movie called All of Me. And this is um, Lily Tomlin and Steve Martin. This is a ni- like 1970s movie, I think. But it was pretty interesting because she... <coughs> um, this uh, eccentric millionaires, she dies, but her soul inhabits her lawyer's body, and you go through this thing, and you almost feel like th- that that's really happening. And maybe Steve Martin's best acting performance. Cultural traditions definitely back dualism, and not every one of them. Uh, some don't focus on this as much, but the survival of the self after the destruction of the body. What will happen when you die? Well, what's the fate of the soul? We, that that's the that's the thought process anyway. And cultures vary, and some share the idea that who you are is separable from your physical thing that you carry around. Your body can be destroyed, but yet your soul lives on. And um, Christians, when asked about this, most Christians say, "Yeah, I'm going to go to heaven." That's what they believe. And a lot of Jewish uh, folks believe the same thing even though their religion isn't as maybe um well structured in terms of what happens next i mean they have a well-structured religion but heaven is not uh as big a factor as it with christianity the really interesting part when surveyed is the atheists who say most of them say i don't believe in religion but after i die yeah i think my spirit's going to go to heaven it's a convenient thought i mean it's isn't it much nicer and ha- a happier version of what you want to occur? I think it's, it's interesting to consider and think about it. And we don't sit around and think about it too often. But So what is the mind? Well, the current scientific view looks at the mind is the body. Mind and body are one. The mind and the brain is one thing. And the mind is what the brain does. Just like computi- computation is the product of a computer, the mind and the brain are one thing, and what you do in your behavior is the output of that brain. So there are some problems with dualism as brought up by science. Science says, can we prove that there is this soul or mind even that's separate from the rest of you and and it's very difficult to do that and we've not been able to get to the bottom of that i'm not saying it is not possible it's obviously anything's possible and with science it's possible i guess until it's and you know i guess it's possible until it's proven that it isn't otherwise but um we now have a better understanding of what physical things we can do and, and what robots and computers can do. And you see, I think it's Gary Kasparov there, who is this grand chess champion from Russia who was beaten by an IBM computer. And for a long time, people thought, well, computers could never e- equal the abilities of a human being. But the computing power that we are currently able to produce is is pretty vast and and pretty incredible and it can do some things but there are some things that the computer definitely can't do that the mind can so there's still you know a long way for uh, computer science to go before it can equal it but there's strong evidence that the role of the brain when studying the science and the anatomy of the human body is powerful and the feeling we have of being detached from our body is really part of the the mechanism of the brain it's kind of interesting here you know, right along the, the line of the mind is what the brain does. Really interesting stuff. Yeah. A computer can beat you at chess, but can a computer read your mind? Is that is that possible? Like, could you sit in an MRI machine and they ask you questions and um, your brain is going to uh, light up on the screen just like it, it's showing there at the top? But could the computer see what it is that you're thinking? 
what they're finding out is that it can on some simple things like house or I think it's dog there's a few other things but the, what's really fascinating is for almost all people that they're looking at when you think of a certain thing like a house part of your brain lights up and the computer can see that and they see the electrical impulses and they say I know what he's thinking about he's thinking about a house and they'll ask you about a cat and that part of your brain that little area will light up and what's wild is that that carries over from person to person pretty well I'm not saying that a computer can read your mind but they're getting they're getting kind of close to, to doing it pretty well and there's been some really cool articles about that 60 minutes did a story called reading your mind and it's right there with Leslie Visser so there's a link in the notes to it if you want to check that out it's pretty interesting so what is really the story behind this and why did Crick and why do other scientists believe that the, the body and the mind are kind of like one thing that's connected well the neuron is one of the reasons for this we have about a thousand billion neurons and probably more in your body and just millions in your brain and in parts of your brain and the, there are sensory neurons there are motor neurons then there are interneurons so there's three basic kinds of neurons and the first one the sensory neuron is the one that you know it makes sense you're going these are the ones that are making sense and understanding all the input that you're getting from the world whether it's sight um, sound touch taste smell um, the neurons that help you move and right now I'm moving my hand and it's doing that because my brain is firing off neural impulses to tell my hand to do it interneurons are the ones that connect those two things together so you make sense of the world and then you move and that that's an interneuron that would help you do that and there are other kinds basically but for our purposes those are the three we really need to focus on neurons can regenerate which is really fascinating and um, helpful in my case as we've talked about some in class with multiple sclerosis it's it's kind of good news to know that there's a possibility that at least if there's not complete neuron regeneration it has repaired itself in some cases they've seen little evidence of that but what we really know is the plasticity of the brain where an area is damaged yet another area of the brain takes over to accomplish a task now in the case of stroke or in my case like with MS that may happen over a long period of time and there are certainly cases where you don't always regain the same kind of abilities you had in the past if certain areas of the brain are damaged but there's this possibility through neuroplasticity now how the neuron fires is interesting too and you see the graphic at the bottom I've got a gun there and it's firing a bullet the neuron fires in much the same way as you pull the trigger on the gun on a regular handgun a semi-automatic weapon whatever I'm not gonna get into that no machine guns right now or AK 47s I'm just talking about a regular handgun you pull the trigger on a regular handgun it gets to a certain point and that's when the, the bullets fired you don't kinda go halfway and then it shoots a little bit or you pull it hard and it fires faster it's certainly not like an Xbox controller where you hit the button harder and it it does the action faster. So that's interesting. It's the build up and it gets to a certain threshold and bam, it fires the signal. Now these signals go pretty quickly and as the case of the picture there on the right, if you touch a hot stove or a hot uh, boiling pot on the stove, your sensory nerves are going to light up and they're going to send information to your brain to tell you to move quickly off the hot pot what's really interesting and we'll talk more about this down the road and I think there's some things in your textbook about it is that when your hand is touching something hot like that there is some pretty good evidence to show that the neural uh, sparks basically that fly the information that goes back to your brain they don't even it didn't make it to your brain because you can pull your hand away quicker than that uh, connection can be uh, brought back to your hand to tell it to move. So, how does that happen? Well, there are sensory neurons that will um, kind of act on their own. And that's fascinating because they're not even really using the brain. The neurons are really an amazing thing. It's almost, in some ways, I'm that's not exact, but it's almost like the atoms. <laughs> but they're they're made up of atoms too. So, uh, but they're they. they 
this is an all or nothing phenomenon. So intensity is expressed either through the number of neurons that are firing. So you'll have instead of just one firing, you might get five. Bam, 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 they're, they're fine. Or they'll do them all at once. Instead of one, they'll do five. That would be more intense. Five would be more intense than one. It could be the frequency of the firing. So it might just be one neuron or set of neurons, but it's instead of like this, tap, 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 it's tap, 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 tap. And then you know, because a lot of people are like, I don't get it, Mr. Do. It's like someone grabs my hand, and if they, they clench it really tightly, I can feel that. It's not a firing neuron where I'm getting one signal. When there's many, many, many neurons firing, and firing at this different intensity thresholds, you know, where you're getting a number of them going or one, then you get a sense of what that means. So it's coding it in a way. You're coding the intensity. And it could be the sheer number of neurons or the frequency firing. Either way, you're you're getting that information to your brain, you're understanding what that means. So what's really fascinating is for a long time science thought that these connections between neurons were like cables so if you have I'll use my cell phone here as an example you have the end of one neuron and it connects to another one it pops in there and connects and that's they're connected physically what we found out is that that is not actually the case what they are is just outside and you cannot even really see it even from there but you can tell it's not connected into it because it's not flush to it like that so it's just outside of it and then it sends a really interesting form of communication across there it's a little bit different than the form of communication that it's used all the way down through and it's going to be more of a chemical connection but this little tiny gap is called a synapse super small where the neuron communicates chemically at that point so one ten thousandth of a millimeter wide that's what we're talking about here and when the neuron fires the axon then sends a chemical shooting through the gap. So what you're looking at here in this neuron picture, and we've talked about this in class and it's in our target sheets, but the cell body there is what's lighting up first on the on this side right here. So the cell body is lighting up. It's sending its signal down through the axon. These little uh, darker spots are what they call the myelin sheath that are protecting it. Um, these are the Ranvier nodes that are just separations and it kind of helps speeds up the process we believe and then it doesn't just stop here and just shoot across in air there is a chemical connection a neurochemical connection that is created so we're going to look at some of those right now this is the part that gets a lot of students kind of confused a good way to look at this and understand it is there are different kinds of chemical connections that communicate across or over those synapse gaps axons release neurotransmitters some are excitatory and some are inhibitory so an excitatory one is going to do what it's going to create an action an inhibitory one is going to uh, stop or prohibit the action the buildup of these is what then ends up firing the neuron uh, down the road so it's kind of a, a an effect that carries over um, on the right side there is a look at at the top this synaptic gap and the little sprinkles in the middle uh, that look kind of like powdered sugar, that's the chemical neur uh, neurotransfer happening there. So let's look at dopamine levels in a normal and a Parkinson's affected neuron. The normal neuron you see at the top of the uh, little drawing here, the dopamine in between, and that's the neurochemical connection there, the neurotransmitter. It is then sent in and received and that normal movement there means you're going to have normal movement of your body. The two gentlemen at the bottom there, Michael J. Fox on the right and Muhammad Ali on the left, um, two of the greatest of all time. He's one of the greatest fighters, boxers of all time, absolutely. I grew up with him and I also grew up with Michael J. Fox on the other side of him uh, on television and he has a new television show on uh, now in year 2013. So. That's interesting. And he's doing that while having this disease called Parkinson's disease. And when you have Parkinson's, you'll see people that, that will shake and they'll have trouble with their motor movements. Also have trouble speaking. So why uh, the dopamine is the reason. 
And you can see over here, L-DOPA is the one we're talking about. Parkinson's disease, a lack of dopamine and L-DOPA in part, and there are other factors, obviously. But you see the, the tiny little two or three that are floating across and not the whole spray of um, excitatory um, connections. But the drugs are also interesting here, and they, they play. When we look at consciousness, we'll get into drugs a lot, a lot more and how they affect consciousness. But there are agonists and antagonists. And so an agonist is going to increase the effectiveness of neurotransmitters. So if you take an agonist drug, it's going to um, speed things up or get things moving. An antagonist is going to slow down the amount of neurotransmitters or destroy those connections or block them. So there's not going to be a signal as much. So those are just some examples of them from alcohol to amphetamines to, um, and amphetamine should probably be green right there if you're, you're looking at this because um, it's either going to be inhibitory or excitatory, uh, excitatory. Amphetamines would speed up. So I think I just did all those the same color, but I don't think they're really matching for any real reason. But those are some different ones. Prozac, an antidepressant, is going to work on serotonin. Depression is a neurotransmitter issue and not getting enough serotonin so Prozac is going to help that transfer happen and deliver more of it. So um, is the brain wired like a personal computer? And I, I think it's pretty obvious to say that that is a new. I mean we think of it as a computer often. Input and output and we're going to talk about that when we do sensation and perception because your senses are going to take in information and then you're going to output something. It's almost like typing on a computer or hitting a um, hitting your cell phone, and you're inputting information in here by tapping it. And I'm going to open my cell phone now, and it's it's giving me output back. The brain does some similar things like that, but it is so different than a computer. And we've not been able to model another brain. Um, the computer is probably the closest thing we've come to like being able to do this. And it's a no on this answer to the question because it's highly resistant to damage. And we talked about neuroplasticity. The brain takes some damage and then maybe potentially, and it's got a chance, it can kind of rewire itself in, in the way of thinking. It's not going to rewire, but the connections are going to be made in different places. And potentially, um, the abilities will be uh, reworked. Our brain is unbelievably fast. And when you look at it, it is just like... A bunch of like I don't know it's just the ugliest looking thing in the world if you would open up someone's head you, and, and you know what the brain can do you'd think it's got bells and whistles and laser light shows in there you'd think it'd be a really fascinating thing to look at and it's just like nothing it's just you, you, if you touched it it would move around you it's hard to even like when they do when they do brain surgery they kind of move the brain as they're uh, poking through it to get to what they need to do the cerebral cortex especially which is the outer portion of the brain uh, it is you know it looks yellowish or like creamish there in the picture on the bottom but in reality it's coursed with blood I mean there's blood just all the way through your brain and it's sort of like constantly working in that fashion so it would be like a computer that's filled with fluid and that would not work the way we do computers today but um, I think it would probably short out and not be able to work. But unlike most human designed computers, the brain works through massively parallel processing. So when we talk about parallel processors and multiple processors, your brain is processing on all kinds of levels in amazing ways. And I think sometimes we think we're so smart and we've got this figured out. We have nowhere near an, a complete understanding of the human brain. We're kind of playing around at this point. It'll be interesting to see how much this changes even in the next five years from what I'm presenting today. So what do different parts of the brain do? You don't need to your brain for everything. Some things, you know, are just kind of inborn instinctive things like sucking in newborns or limb flexion and with withdrawal from pain. And we talked about that with like the sensation if you touch a hot stove, you pull back pretty quickly because those sensory neurons are going to tell you to do that on their own and not even like communicate with your brain. They'll send signals to your brain but they don't get back there quick enough to make you do that. Vomiting is one that we've all probably had to go down that road before and your brain's not really helping you do that. You can tell yourself don't, don't, but you're still gonna do that. So 
let's move on. What does the brain do? Uh, some subcortial structures here that we need to look at. And this is real interesting um, in a, a way of looking at the brain. This part right here is the cerebellum and the brain stem leads up to the medulla um, and the uh, hypothalamus is at the top here with some other features um, the thalamus above it and the pons and the uh, amygdala is in there as well but the cerebral cortex is blue part that's where the action is and that's where the deep thought is and that's where the amazing human experience comes from and the type of consciousness that we have that is so special that you know we really believe that it's 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 something more than our body that's the dualist perspective it's so this cerebral cortex is outer layer it's crumpled and you know it's crumpled if you pulled out the cerebral cortex and you flattened it out on a table or across the floor it'd be about two feet square so you took it out and flattened it 80 percent of our brain is cortex and that's a really fascinating thing here what many people believe and scientifically it seems to make pretty good sense is this little uh, pinkish purplish spot the cerebellum which is for used for complicated motor movements and it has about 30 billion neurons in there in this little tiny spot right in the back of our brain many people call this in the in the biological and science world the reptilian brain or an early ad adapted brain it's like the earliest of the brain and then it grew out from there over time I mean is that true hard to tell but you can kind of see where there are some serious functioning here that would be like reptilian in a way you know do, do reptiles uh, crawl around and and have deep thoughts I don't think that they do because they don't have this blue area called um, the cerebral cortex the hypothalamus is right above all this the reddish area here and it controls hunger thirst and so to some extent sleep so some really basic drives and motivations that make us human but we can choose not to listen to it. And I've been doing that too often here lately and not getting enough sleep. My cerebral cortex is saying, well, if I get these videos done and I work hard on this, next year is gonna be easier. My kids are gonna do better on the AP test. I need to keep working through this. Um, but the hypothalamus is probably saying, you need to go to sleep. You need to get your rest. So we've kind of evolved in some ways in what we call the primate brain in the middle and then to this human experience the cerebral cortex that now is um, kind of helping us think very deep thoughts this is real important I believe and these are the four um, main lobes of the brain so the frontal parietal parietal uh, the occipital in the back and then the temporal at the bottom there are different ways to remember these um, I think um, we're going to do a little uh, presentation on that. There's a really great video from Psychology 101 on YouTube that has all those, you know, hungry hounds, eight Pavlov, and all those nice little ways to remember the parts of the brain. Um, Freud tore uh, his pants off. Freud tore pa his pants off. So Freud tore pants off. That's the way you remember these four lobes. So I'll I'll do that up here soon so it'll maybe step you through that some more with the same kind of sing-songy approach that they have with it with memory tricks but then also with the information about what all these lobes do but the frontal lobe is like your CEO of your your little own personal company here it's the executive function and it's developed the last the last part of developments come from the frontal lobe the uh, temporal lobe as I call it like a girl would temporarily temporarily or temporally tuck her hair behind her ear. Of course, I don't have any hair to do that with because, yeah, although I do need a haircut. Um, and that hair sometimes doesn't stay there, so it kind of falls out. It's a temporal. Another way to think of it as the temple. And the temporal lobe stretches right back this way. Now, this was the CEO or decision-making area. This is going to help you in some other ways, but mostly with uh, processing hearing. That makes a lot of sense because it's right by the ear. Parietal lobe on top is going to help with some motor movements, and the motor cortex runs through there. We're, we're going to discuss that some more. The occipital lobe in the back is where, you know, the way I, I think of it, and you can think of occipital and, um, you know, the eye doctor and seeing, and some people think of the O as an eye. I, I think of it as like a projection uh, screen, like you're, you're, 
seeing information here, you're sending it through your brain that projects onto the back. And I always think of like the brain, like viewing it from the back and making sense of it there. And, and it's more complicated than that. We'll see a little bit more of it here as we go through. It's definitely vision is the uh, probably the most important of our senses because we take so much information in visually. Uh, let's look at the cerebral cortex mapping and projection areas. This is pretty wicked. I mean, it's amazing to think that on these uh, lobes of our brain, on the exterior here, we have a topographical map of our body. And they're able to tell this because like when they open up someone's brain and they electrically stimulate certain parts, now people will um, move their hands or their arm or their finger, or their head, their neck, their, their trunk, their hip, or they'll feel sensation there. And so really interesting, especially along the motor cortex there in red and on the left, and on the other side, the um, the greenish area, which is the sem uh, uh, some some uh, somatosensorial uh, cortex. Man, I am uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> you get the picture. I'm fumbling some words today. In a minute, I'll come right back and say it correctly. But the size in, in uh, the size in this area in this mapping is really kind of cool. Um, if you notice like your shoulder there's like hardly anything there and here's shoulder here and shoulder here okay but like where is there a spot that's really pretty big wow look at the lips the jaw and the mouth look at the territory that it takes up on the outer part of your cortex and why is that we use our mouth a lot more than you operate your shoulder and I think that's probably why the mapping is there the shoulders tiny on our map and the mouth is huge and the reason being just importance and use probably by the brain let's look at some sub subcortial structures so you've got less than a quarter of the human cortex contains projection areas those are the projection areas we just showed you right here they're sometimes called mapping or projection areas so less than a quarter of it is is that the rest is huge in language reasoning moral thought and those types of things there's a couple spots called that are real important on the left side, the left hemisphere. One area is called the Broca's area, and that'd be right here. And then back behind it a little bit, back behind your ear, would be the Wernicke's area. These are two spots where Broca and Wernicke have been able to determine that language is important in those areas. And I have the helmet down there with the uh, cerebral cortex on it for a reason. You know, doctors and researchers and people who study brain science. Well, they love you guys who don't wear helmets because now they have a chance to look at a brain that's open and as they're doing surgery, they learn things. So, you know, in Texas, you don't have to wear a helmet, I guess. There's certain laws against them or prohibiting, allowing you not to wear them. If you, if you want to do that, good luck. Um, but some very bad things could happen to you in your brain other than just uh, on a motorcycle. Apraxia is really interesting where you cannot coordinate your movements. Um, and so that's something that they have tested me for quite a lot with MS because um, you, you, can, you can feel that and I feel that sometimes and that's why I wear a cane to make sure I know where the floor is. Um, agnosia, agnosia is this disorder that isn't quite blindness. The eyes are intact. They see just fine. But they lose the ability in their in their brain to decipher or understand objects or faces. And that's really interesting. I mean, they will literally see a face and it'll look exactly like this. Like they'll just see blanks or they'll see objects that make up the person's face. And uh, Wheaton has a really interesting story in one of the versions of his textbooks. I don't remember which one, but he says uh, there's a documented case about a man who lost the ability to recognize a familiar object which was his wife's face and so every time he would see her he thought her face was a flower he thought she was a flower and so he'd reach out to kind of grab it and to smell it that's just the oddest thing ever isn't it i mean that your brain could deceive you that much but if there's an area of the brain and there are areas of the brain that are important for this if they're damaged by stroke or a seizure or some kind of disease you're gonna have you can have these types of issues happen and, and they're not common but they're possible 
Sensory neglect is when you no longer can use the side of your body or don't even know that it exists or anything is there. So that's really wild. Like a person could be holding something or this table next to me is sitting here and I could have my arm on it and someone can say, hey, uh, Mr. Duez, uh, uh, do you know where that table is? Can you get the, can you get the, uh, the phone off the table? And the phone's sitting right here and here's the table and I would be like what table there's no table there and I could look over there to my left side and I would not never see the table or I'd see something else alternative alternatively um, aphasia is uh, the broca area and sometimes when this is damaged a person will lose their ability to speak but they'll say a similar word over and over again like tan and then they'll just say for everything tan 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 and they think, I think, they believe they're speaking and making sense, but nothing is coming out. What's coming out is 10, 10, 10. Uh, kind of amazing. But acquired psycho psycho psychopathy is another one where damage to parts of your brain in the frontal lobe rob you from the ability to know right or wrong. And we'll look at the teen brain some this week, and yeah, some of you kind of have a problem with that because your frontal lobes aren't absolutely finished um, developing and then by developing we're, we're talking about the pruning of those neural connections so that you can basically get a neural connective uh, situation that serves you and suits you well and can help you make good decisions with too many connections you would not be able to tell right from wrong or you might might make some really bad decisions and we'll see some stories of people who have done that through time so how many minds do you have and and really if you think about it you've got these two halves of your brain um, the two hemispheres they're connected by the corpus callosum which we'll discuss here in a little bit and this is overplayed some and I think people are now understanding neuroplasticity is so important and it really does exist that not everyone is so focused on right-handed and left-handed areas dealing with you know your different kinds of different parts of your body so if you look here like the hand that's being that's writing it's the right hand I, I like that they did this because this works for a right-handed person this image here if you're someone who's ambidextrous or can use both hands or who is left-handed this throws this out of whack pretty well but for a typical right-handed person and most people are right-handed the brain mapping in some ways or the, the the areas here are similar I'm not saying that they're exact, but they're pretty similar. So this is not the right hand, even though it's the right side of the body. So there's this switching that happens. It happens ocularly, and you'll see that with the occipital lobe, but it also happens um, with handedness. Now when it gets spread down to the hands, it gets reconnected, which is just fascinating that the brain works in this very strange way. And um, We'll talk more about vision next week it's also pretty interesting this is a story about right and left brained people um, and if you had your corpus callosum severed and it's like a super highway of fibers that connect the right and left hemispheres if that's severed and destroyed you basically become a two-brained person they have two brains they can operate both hands independently we'll learn about Kim Peek later in the year he has a similar um, ability in some ways or had a similar ability as a, uh, a savant and I think there's a slide on him in just a second here but the brain has these two hemispheres they're connected by the corpus callosum and this, this is a major pathway and some of the functions of the brain are lateralized so most people and I have to say most people because not everyone they do language on the left side of the brain and we talked about Broca's area and Wernicke um, we know this is true. If, if someone's taken an injury to that side of the brain, they've often had trouble with language, or they've had a stroke in, in, and it's occurred in that part of the brain, they'll have some trouble with language. The opposite is the case on the right, so math and music abilities. I think it's playing music that's on the right side. Lateralization is never 100%, and there have been some fascinating things done with uh, functional MRIs and other techniques of imaging the brain where they've looked at people with extraordinary abilities like in math or um, language abilities or memorization and they've found that they have areas that are lighting up when they're performing these tasks that most people would never use and we've not seen used by most people so they're able to like 
for some reason their brain has developed in a different way and it's given them abilities. Sensory information is also sent to the opposite hemisphere. It's just like we looked at here with the right and left handedness. Um, and sensory information has this contralateral organization. Sensory data crosses over pathways leading to the cortex, which is the outer portion of the brain. This visual crossover is very fascinating. And you see at the bottom here, you're looking at an image that's purple and orange. What happens? The eye brings it in, and what do you get? It's flipped. It's orange here and purple there. It goes through your brain in these interesting ways, through the optic uh, chasm. And on the back, what are you seeing in the back of the brain? It, the image is flipped as well. So we'll look more at this when we study vision with sensation and perception, but fascinating how the brain can decipher this. Oftentimes, the images are also upside down on the retina I mean that that's that's pretty wild that the brain can get make sense of the world when it's it's being pulled in in, in such a, a strange way the left visual field goes to the right hemisphere and the right field to the left other senses do some similar things and this might help you see this better I like this uh, quite a lot so it's got a, a lateral slice of the brain or a I don't know if lateral is the right term it's got a slice of the brain and then you've got the nasal cavity here, okay, in the front, so your nose would be here. Here are your two eyeballs, and the visual field that's coming in here, and the visual field coming in there, it's pulling that information. You can kind of follow the green and red as it goes through the, um, the, the nucleus here. We don't really need to know the nucleus or the superior um, colliculus here, but that's an area that helps us decipher sight. So, so to say that the back of the brain is completely doing um, vision isn't correct, but if you have an injury back there you're not going to be able to see very well or you may have temporary blindness until you have some healing or um, the swelling subsides in, in your brain. Um, really interesting how the brain works and how it functions. Co uh, contralateral uh, motor control you also have this right hemisphere controls the left side of the body issue and so you can see it there on the top with the occipital lobes, um, the central uh, sulcus, sulcus uh, motor area and the sensory area, and then the frontal lobes. And so what are you seeing here? Occipital lobes, occipital lobes are in the back. So this is the back of the head. This is the front of the lobes. So it gives you an idea where these are running. And so, and here's a, an idea of what it's looking like through the motor neurons. So the left controls the right side, the right controls the left side, and there's another way of looking at this. Stroke-induced patients are, are going to go through this uh, paresis where they're going to lose function of their hand, and the stroke is going to happen on the opposite side of their brain. So if I lost function of my left hand, I probably have some issues on the right side of my brain. Um, really interesting stuff. Um, and that at the bottom, they've got this neuroprosthetic uh, restoration and they're sending information into another part of the brain to help figure out and make sense to work through this. I think it's fascinating what they're able to do these days like that. The corpus callosum is a super highway in the middle like we said. It's, it's the pathways that are connecting um, all this information from left and right uh, hemisphere and what's really interesting is it's going to connect the comparable structures on each side so that it's able to process this. It permits the data received on one side to be processed in both hemispheres and really at the same time this information is being traded so quickly and it aids motor coordination, the corpus callosum on, of the left and the right side. This is a person with a genesis of the corpus callosum and basically what it means is it's missing the nerve connections in the center there that are really important for the corpus callosum to do its work. Without it a person may have a lot of trouble with motor coordination, maybe not even be able to address themselves, but they also may have other abilities or deficits depending upon how they have developed. And this person, um, who is seen here on the right side, uh, is Kim Peek. Kim Peek's brain, as you're looking at it here, is at the bottom, and a normal brain's at the top, and you can see right away what's missing. And what's missing is the corpus callosum. There is no corpus callosum in Kim Peek's brain. He was able to memorize books. He could read a book by reading the left page and the right page at the very same time. Right eye reading 
the right page, left eye reading the left page, and know everything in that book and almost have it completely memorized. He was kind of made famous by Dustin Hoffman, uh, who portrayed him in the movie Rain Man. Sometime this semester we'll probably get a chance to see a really fascinating documentary about um, Kim Peek and, and his father down here on the bottom left side who had to dress him and take care of him, but yet this man could memorize entire volumes at the library. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Real quickly, we're going to talk about the story of H.M. Henry Gustav um, Mollison, who became famous as H.M., which was his initials in the research textbooks. But born in 1926, and after a bicycle accident at age 7, he suffered from debilitating epilepsy. And in 53, the epilepsy was so bad that they decided to go into his brain and operate and try to fix the issue. What they did was... Um, try to sever you know the corpus callosum area and they do that sometimes too and that helps to stop seizures so they split the brain what they did was kind of messed up they took way too much brain and one of the things that they took out was the hippocampus and this is a very important part of the brain for memory so what HM suffered was something called severe and anterior grade amnesia which we'll talk about that when we get to the memory uh part of the of the of the book and we'll probably talk about hm a little bit more there he was otherwise a normal person but no longer able to commit events to memory so he would remember things from years ago that happened to him but he would not reading remember reading the newspaper he had just read moments ago um and and he was always stuck in the present moment a, a, a minute would go by and he wouldn't remember what had just happened uh, for the rest of his life, life, HM was studied pretty extensively and revolutioning the understanding of human memory. So it took like an accident or really even a mistake and damage to the brain to have us understand it better and know what these areas were capable of because, you know, we're just not wired to understand it. It takes research and science to help us understand. And his he's provided, his case provided, broad evidence for the rejection of old theories and the formation of new theories about human memory and all the underlying neural structures. Um, he died in 2008 and neuroscientists were provided with a mo the most extensive and most extensively studied brain in history and there's some information here about it and the doctors who are um, keeping this project alive and trying to collect some information. I just want to show you on the right side here this is the area that they removed of his brain. So this is a, 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 a view from the brain stem underneath. And you see, of course, the cere uh, cerebellum. Um, and up underneath it, this is the normal brain on the right side. So all this uh, tissue here, they've removed. Well, by removing that, you've removed um, the hippocampus. And his brain just did not work the way that most brains do any longer kind of sad. This is a man called Clive Waring, and uh, he also suffers from a very similar problem. This is a kind of an interesting video. You can check it out if you'd like. We may get a chance to watch it in class, where his wife asks him a series of questions about a trip that she's leaving, and he won't remember what she said two minutes later, or even, I think it's even like 30 seconds later. It's kind of sad in a way, but amazing the man can keep going about life and, and living his life. So, Reaching the end here and, and kind of wrapping this up, we've learned a lot about the brain today, but um, we started with this dualist idea, and, you know, we're talking science here, um, not talking beliefs, and not talking about the soul entirely, but honestly, I mean, there's a lot we don't know about the brain, and we certainly don't understand consciousness. That's what they consider to be the hard problem in science. It's the hardest problem and we just can't wrap our minds around something that's so central to our mind the ability for a human and you see him here at the top um, to be conscious of himself um, experiencing what he himself is going through that's a level of consciousness that's kind of beyond the science at this point and they show you stages of consciousness there, and we've talked about unconscious, subconscious, and consciousness. But that also uh, deals with the, we can see a direct connection between the brain waves, the theta de delta, uh, the alpha, and the beta brain waves. When we look at consciousness, and we'll have a whole chapter on that later on, we'll get involved in this some more. But this idea of what it's like 
and uh, qualia, that's the term used in philosophy, it's a Latin term for what sort or what kind. And to understand what an individual experiences is very difficult. You know what you experience or have a, a feel for it, but the pain of a headache, like you can't really tell what, what that is unless you're experiencing it yourself and you're not really very conscious of it. Also, like the redness or the color of an evening sky, you're not going to know what that is unless you're experiencing it yourself. Um, also, a bit of humility here is how, this is a quote by Huxley, how is it that anything so remarkable as the state of consciousness comes about as a result of irritating nerves, nervous tissue? And that's what the neurons are doing. Is it just as unaccountable as the appearance of Jin when uh, Aladdin rubs the lamp? I mean, is it just like popping into thin air? How does this happen just based upon neurons firing and neurochemistry uh, happening? It's, it, it is the hardest problem and an interesting one to think about. And there's no wonder that we do have religion and um, cultural uh, traditions that think of it in a dualist perspective. It's easier, I think. It just makes more sense. And, and maybe that's for a reason. But science hasn't been able to unwrap that problem and, or see what it is that we believe so strongly in. But uh, the bit of a humility part two here is this idea, and this is, again, I wanted to give kind of a shout to uh, Paul Bloom at Yale University because I, I looked at this and, and adapted a lot of what he he worked on to build this presentation, but a mechanistic conception of mental life. If you're going to have that mechanistic, mechanistic uh, conception that we are... Um, neurons firing. We're a bag of neurons. That's what we are. What about these humanistic values that we feel so strongly about, like free will and responsibility, the intrinsic value of people and others, and, and the spiritual value we've been mentioning here? Can they be reconciled and understood in a deeper way as we learn more science? I mean, does it shut down that side of us, and, and is that even something we want to do, or would it be dangerous? So, um, the next few presentations from this chapter will focus in on a lot of knowledge-based, straight right to it, um, parts of the neuron and their function, parts of the brain and the central nervous system and their function, and then we're going to move on to sensation and perception. So until next time, uh, don't forget to be awesome.